Well, first of all, thank you very much, Gordon, for inviting me to this particular meeting, but I should also really say thanks for organizing the Human Glycome Project. I think this is just such an important exercise to bring the scientific community together. I think as scientists, we always want to do our own stuff, and uh, you know, there are certain people who are selfless, like Gordon, who really brings us all together and makes us think about where the area should go. So I think it's such an important initiative, and, and thanks very much, Gordon, for, for doing that. So what I've been tasked today to talk about is using uh, enzymes for glycoengineering, and that's really one of our main projects uh, in, in my group. Um, not only with relevance to the human glycome project, but um, what we're really interested in is generally using enzymes to manipulate glycoconjugates. Uh, as you're all aware, and we've heard already, uh, glycans often occur in biology as glycoconjugates, as part of proteins, and this is a st the old structure of, of, of EPO here on cell surfaces, but obviously also in plant metabolites. Uh, and also increasingly we have uh, sort of biomaterials that are interesting for glycans. So we're very interested in uh, developing synthetic tools and also analytical tools for, for these glycoconjugates. They're very complicated. And our proposition is that enzymes are particularly useful for this purpose. Of course, in other areas of biology, very familiar with the use of enzymes, analyzing proteins, making proteins, DNA, and so on. There are lots of enzymes commercially available, and I think maybe in the glyco area, there are not so many enzymes available, and I think we're trying to develop more and making them available to the giant uh, community. Obviously, one class of enzymes that sadly is missing for glycans are polymerases, so when we make glycans, we still have to uh, do them in a stepwise manner. And this is just an, an example of some work from us, but there are many, many people working on the enzymatic synthesis of glycans. There are hundreds of examples now where this has been done really successfully. Um, but this, I just want to show this um, to illustrate how really very easily you can generate complex tetrasaccharides, for example, like the target structure here, uh, on peptides um, uh, or on proteins by just using consecutive uh, uh, glycosyl transferases, and you can even do this in, in um, one pot. So you just put all the enzymes in, and obviously the whole system is pre-programmed to really make this very, very specific tetrasaccharide structure. You don't need necessarily biosynthetic enzymes from that particular pathway, so what we've done here is borrowed similar homologs from other pathways that were easier to ex access, and yet uh, the whole system just still with exquisite selectivity assembles uh, you know, these, these target sequences. And I should say, in this case, we have actually confirmed that by very rigorous NMR analysis, uh, collaborating with Gerhard Wittmann in Stockholm, and you can see here the sort of anomeric region, it really without minimal, minimal purification, uh, you, uh, you can generate with high selectivity your, your target sequencing. And if you compare that with the chemistry, and we are actually also chemists, you know, this is extremely difficult to achieve with chemical methods. So in terms of synthesis, this enzymes are really good. The, the drawback is that these enzymes are not generally available. There are only very few glycoenzymes available. We all know, especially the transferases, are very difficult to express, you know, quite unstable and so on. So we have a major effort to, to really generate more robust enzymes. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. So how do we get uh, glycoenzymes. You know, we have a long wish list of glycoenzymes. I think all of you would have, you know, your, your enzymes you would like to have. Um, so how do we get access to it? And we're using different approaches. And in my talk, I want to just illustrate uh, the sort of different approaches we use to, to generate new uh, glycoenzymes. And I switch from the transferases for a moment to another class of enzymes. And these are sugar oxidases because I think they might be quite useful for sort of targeted glycomics uh, approaches. Uh, the sugar oxidase you probably know most is uh, glucose oxidase, which is not really sort of relevant here, which is the top uh, reaction here. Um, but um, the one I want to draw your attention to is an enzyme called galactose oxidase. It's not a new enzyme. Uh, it's been used for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, it actually has even been used in a sort of glycomics experiment, Hakomori, uh, as you can see here in the 70s, used galactose oxidase to, uh, for cell surface labeling. Uh, 
Uh, so it's a great enzyme for glycoconjugates in that it very, very selectively targets galactose. It's highly selective for galactose. Um, so it will really only oxidize galactose on a very complex cell surface even. Um, and also, it introduces this very nice bioorthogonal group in aldehyde. So we all know about click chemistry these days and bioorthogonal chemistry. Aldehydes are actually beautiful bioorthogonal groups. They're not very stable, so you wouldn't use them in sort of a metabolic labeling type approach. But if you can cell surface, introduce them as enzymes, they're very, very nice uh, bioorthogonal group. And there are numerous labels you can use uh, to to, to use this. And what he's simply done here is uh, he reduced them with the radioactive borotritiide and then just did a radioactive labeling. So we thought this is a great system. Are there other enzymes that could do this? So you could use this as a complementary approach to lectins. You know, if you have enzymes that are specific for mannose or glucose on cell surfaces, you could just label them and that would be a great complementary way to some of the other tools uh, we have. And it turns out, if you go through the databases, and we have done that quite extensively, repeatedly, this is a very, very small class of enzymes, and there don't seem to be many others around, certainly if you look at homolo homologs. Uh, it's well studied. I don't want to go through the mechanism now. It's got this very shallow active site. This is the copper center here, and that explains why it works so nicely on these very complex glycoconjugates. It really is an enzyme that works nicely on surfaces. But alas, it's very highly selective for galactose. Uh, so we really couldn't find any useful homologs that would maybe you know, work on, on other sugars. So we used uh, an approach called directed evolution, which has been actually a very prominent approach now. It's just the Nobel Prize in chemistry has just been given for that. And indeed, actually, the person who's been given the Nobel Prize in chemistry, Francis Arnold, actually worked on galactose oxidase. So I thought it would be good to bring that up here. Um, and what she did, actually, uh, she did the first work on trying to modify the substrate specificity of this enzyme, also to make it more stable. It's a somewhat unstable enzyme. And she generated multiple mutations at, around the active site, generated a so-called M1 mutant using directed evolution, which is basically sort of a laboratory evolution technique. Uh, what you need is a very good screen. And it turns out uh, galactose oxidase has a, has, a, has a side product of peroxide which is very, very easy to screen for in high throughput format. So this is a perfect enzyme for doing directed evolution. And as I said, she got the Nobel Prize uh, uh, very recently uh, for uh, her work on developing uh, and pioneering directed evolution, which is used in, in, in many areas now. So we took her M1 mutant um, and tried to develop mutants that actually would uh, oxidize other sugars. So uh, I'll just go fairly quickly through it and just show you the summary of all that work uh, so far. Um, so what you have here is a table of the mutants on the left wild type. That's Francis Arnold's M1 mutant. And then a whole set of mutants with multiple mutations we developed by selecting for enzymes that have broader specificity. And then we just tested them against different sugars. You can see the wild type here is highly selective for galactose. Actually also takes tallows, which is the two, uh, C2 uh, epimer, uh, but no activity against, for example, glucose, mannose, uh, and so forth. Really highly selective. Uh, Francis Arnold's mutant already has a little bit of activity now against glucose. Indeed, actually, that's what she was looking for. She was looking for an alternative glucose oxidase. Um, but as we go along, our mutations now, you get you know darker and darker colors. So dark means high activity, uh, white means low activity. And you can see here you get these mutants like the F2 mutant that has now actually very uh, broad selectivity. So we haven't actually uh, changed the selectivity from galactose to another sugar yet, but we have broadened it. So you can use it as a much more a much broader enzyme uh, for cell surf surface uh, sugar labeling. Um, and in a context where you have, let's say, only mannose uh, or only anacetylglucosamine, we were interested in can we actually, are these enzymes, are these mutants now good enough to give us efficient, detectable uh, cell surface labeling and labeling on proteins. And we demonstrated in this paper that we can do this on proteins. And I'll just show you a picture as well, that we can now label, for example, yeast cells. So 
you all will know that yeast cells have a lot of mannose, they don't have galactose on their surface. Um, and this mutant uh, H1 actually was able to, uh, you know, with, with good uh, uh, um, selectivity and intensity, uh, uh, label the mannose on, on yeast cells. So this can, again, that like Komori showed for the wild type, can be used to actually label uh, cell surfaces. And you can put a fluorescent label on, but you can also put biotin on. You know, so it's a really uh, a nice, as I said, orthogonal method uh, to existing methods. So, uh, and in fact, she actually, uh, Barbara Impriali recently did publish quite a nice paper where she used uh, to, to label Campylobacter, which has a selective uh, uh, sugar uh, uh, on the surface. So we think, think these ends up, these are robust, they can be expressed in E. coli. If anyone is interested in them, you know, I'd be happy to make them available. So going, following up on that, you know, slightly older work I've just uh, described, we were interested in uh, silic acids. You've already had an introduction to silic acids, so I don't need to say much about the importance of silic acids on cell surfaces. Um, and what we thought might be quite interesting to see whether we could use this enzyme system to distinguish between uh, neuraminic acid, which is shown here, and n glycolyl neuraminic acid, which is shown there. Uh, you will be familiar with the work in particular by Varki, uh, who's done a lot of work on n glycolyl neuraminic acid. Um, and uh, in indeed, actually what happens is this is, this is a sh cell surface sugar in animals, but not in humans. Uh, humans lack the enzyme that converts neuraminic acid to glycolyl neuraminic acid, and there are qu quite a lot of papers on implicating this in uh, in disease. Because if you take uh, n glycolyl neuraminic acid as as food, you know, in, in meat, for example, or uh, also in the production of biopharmaceuticals, it gets transferred onto proteins. Uh, you know, and people are always concerned about n glycolyl neuraminic acid context. Detection of n glycolyl neuraminic acid is at the moment by uh, antibody. Uh, so we were wondering whether we could develop an enzyme assay, just so again as a complementary method. Um, and also see whether, you know, we, uh, KDN would be, uh, would be a substrate. If you look at the table I showed before, is uh, n neuraminic acid itself is not a substrate for this enzyme. We've never seen any activity. So despite the fact it has this somehow exposed hydroxyl group, which you might think the C9 would, could potentially be a substrate for this enzyme, it does not get oxidized. So, uh, so this is not a substrate for the enzyme. But we were wondering whether this hydroxyl group here, which is after all the one difference, would actually be oxidized. Uh, so what we're looking for is really whether we find a mutant that does this reaction with high selectivity. Just goes for that extra hydroxyl group, which is the difference between the two. And we thought this might be a really nice uh, tool. Ashley Matty in my group did this work, and his manuscript is just uh, uh, under review. The reason we thought this might be useful is because there was some evidence also from modeling that this n glycolyl group is particularly good at fitting at the active site uh, uh, of this enzyme. So we had some sort of theoretical evidence that we might be able to do this. Um, and indeed, actually, what, what Ashley did first is he just took xylar lactose itself and the n glycolyl equivalent treated it with galactose oxidase and he just found one mutant, the F2 mutant, that actually did this reaction really with very, very high uh, efficiency on the trisaccharide uh, level and also on the monosaccharide level. And he managed to fully characterize this compound. You appreciate there are lots of hydroxyl groups here, uh, you know, so you really have to make sure you hit the right one. And he unambiguously showed that with NMR, and I haven't, I haven't got the data here, but uh, th that's absolutely confirmed uh, on that. Um, and, and this is sort of a new reaction on and glycolyl and neuraminic acid. Uh, the question was, can we do this also on a protein which contains silic acid and n glycolyl neuraminic acid? So alpha acid glycoprotein has about 10% n glycolyl neuraminic acid and 90% uh, 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 silic acid. So we treated that with F2. Uh, and then we found actually with a bacterial silidase we could cleave everything off. Um, and that allowed us to just by mass spectrometry uh, look at the, cle the, the all the silic acids that they were cleaved off and see which ones uh, were uh, oxidized. Um, and it showed very clearly in blue here, we've got the normal silic acid, neuraminic acid, and here we have the glycolyl neuraminic acid. You can see it's a minor component. Uh, and if you look after the reaction, you get a mass shift of minus two. 
corresponding to the oxidation, whereas you don't get any mass shift with acid. So this is a really highly selective enzyme of N-glycolyl over neuromenic uh, uh, acid. And in particular, in combination with the salidase, it's often quite a selective reaction. I should say this F2 mutant still has some galactose activity against galactose and mannose and so on. So it will actually also oxidize the underlying sugars, but it won't oxidize salic acid. So we think the, these sugar oxidases you know, might provide a very nice uh, tool, uh, and possibly also in, in, in sort of glycomic studies, if you have very specific questions, for example, about a glycolyl and neuromic acid context. But going back to the salic acids, um, obviously these are very, very important. And as I said before, having enzymes as tools to cleave salic acids selectively, to synthesize them selectively, um, would be very, very valuable. So what we're developing at the moment is sort of a toolkit uh, that uh, targets these, these, in particular, the most common structures, the 2,6 and the 2,3 linkage, um, and provide the community with salidases and salal trans phrases and corresponding core factor enzymes that are really easily accessible. And uh, actually, at the moment, we're trying to make them uh, also freely available. So if anyone is interested, please uh, come and uh, talk to us. Uh, and once we were compiling this, and, and I should say these are all microbial enzymes, they're all expressed in E. coli through a company uh, called Prosomics. Uh, and I should also state I haven't got any stake in prosomics, they're just collaborators, but they're a very good company for high throughput, cheap expression of enzymes, and I think that's what's needed sort of uh, in this field. And at the moment, we've got five to three salal transferases, two to six sal specific salal transferases, some CMP nanosynthetases, which you need if you want to make the cofactors, some aldolases as well if you want to make the salic acids, um, and then some uh, salidases. Uh, uh, and now when we, when we sort of assembled this toolkit, we thought, well, what we need is everything for 2.3 and 2.6. Um, and what we noted, actually, in the literature is that there are lots of 2.3 selective salidases. There are quite a lot of salidases that cleave both, but we could not find an alpha 2.6 specific salidase, which was actually quite a gap we thought. Um, and developing that whole toolkit, we thought we needed to develop an enzyme that would do very selective 2-6 uh, cleavage as well in the presence um, of D3. And as I said, none of these salidases was available. We looked again in the database, we cloned a few salidases, but almost all of them had either selectivity for 2-3 or broad selectivity. So we felt there was a real gap on, on that. Um, and here, we developed a slightly different approach in terms of defining this enzyme activity. Uh, obviously, you could use directed evolution, but we don't really have a very good screen. So we decided to look actually for promiscuous activity. So we thought about trying to find enzymes that might have this silidase activity as a promiscuous activity. Um, based on our knowledge of enzyme activity. And those of you who know a lot about bacterial transferases, uh, sorry, and, and as I said, actually to screen this and just to show you how to use these enzymes, um, we actually made substrates. We made uh, fluorescent subs uh, um, fr substrates with a 2, 3, and 2, 6 linkage so that we could screen for very selective activity. And I think this just shows also very nicely. This is not new work, I should say. A lot of people have done uh, this sort of workflow. We just published this very recently, making, making these particular targets. Uh, these are the enzymes I've just described. So we've got this aldolase that can make you salic acid. The CMP nanosynthase can make you the cofactor so you don't have to buy it, which is very expensive. And then you can use silyl transferases to make very selectively um, your particular uh, silocyte. Um, and you can do this all in one pot. You know? So this is really quite easy to use if you've got access uh, to the enzyme. So we made those two and then used them to actually find this selective alpha-2,3 selective salidase activity. And as I said, those of you who know bacterial transferases, salal transferases know that they're very selective for 2,3 or 2,6, but they're also reversible. So we thought, can we actually exploit the reversibility of some of these enzymes and use them in salidase mode? Not change the enzyme, but just use the reaction conditions so that they work as a salidase. And I should say, not all of them do, but we found one from Photobacterium species, which is a known enzyme, I should say. Um, if you add CMP to that uh, reaction and expose them to the silicide, you find that they actually they work as a silidase 
because they are reversible. And you drive the reaction towards hydrolysis, adding CMP. And I should say it only works with CMP. And when we tested them against 2, 3, and 2, 6, they were very highly selective to mixtures and either 2, 3, and 2, 6. So this is an example where you can find an enzyme uh, you know, from, from known enzymes, but you actually really uh, use, use them in a different mode. Um, so that's also possible. We also wanted to know whether this works in very complex setting, very nice, you know, to just expose a trisaccharide or disaccharide to it. Uh, so we did actually quite a detailed analysis on, on glycoproteins using HILIC. First of all, we got a standard from Lutger, which was this biotenary standard, which was only 2,6 silylated, we knew that, and it's just a HILIC profile of the standard, uh, treating it with this pseudosalidase, that's what we call it, pseudosalidase. Uh, and you can see that it works. Uh, you can get complete conversion. It's quite a slow enzyme, I should say. You, you, start, you stop over sort of at the monosalylated structure and there's no selectivity uh, in this particular case. Um, we then uh, took, looked at fetuin. So fetuin has both 2, 3 and 2, 6. So this is really the challenge. Does it still work? Does the selectivity uh, still work on fetuin? Uh, so if you, if you do the hillic on fetuin, uh, you get a profile like this. Um, if you treat it with 2, 3 salidase, a selective 3 salidase, you get that. Uh, if you have an unspecific one, you cleave almost all the salic acids off. If you use ours, you clearly get a very different uh, profile, as you can see. Um, so um, uh, we, that was nice, but it doesn't really tell you still whether it's very selective. Uh, so we wanted to know, do we really have 2, 3 selectivity. So I just want to talk uh, uh, very quickly about an analytical tool we use very often to really dig into the structure, which is iron mobility. And it allowed us to look at the fragments which we generate through mass fragmentation and analyze it by iron mobility. And that showed us very clearly that uh, we can separate, this is from a complex protein sample, uh, by MSMS followed by iron mobility, the B3 iron, which is this fragment here, in terms of 2, 3, and 2, 6. Um, and we could show very clearly that with our pseudosalidase, we only cleave the 2, 6, and we leave the 2, 3 uh, remaining, whereas the others go the other way uh, around. So iron mobility spectrometry is actually a very, very nice tool to sort of give you something about the isomeric uh, composition. So just a minute, I just want to talk a very new project. Um, but what we also try to do is re-engineering of proteins, so going even more complicated. Really, can we use these glycosyl transferase to re-engineer protein? This is a collaboration with Pauline Rudd. We've got a joint student at Pallister with her. Uh, and that works as well. You can use silyl transferases to put, for example, silic acid onto alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin, which has very important uh, applications in biopharmaceuticals. But what Ed found, actually, when he did this, and looked very carefully at the silylation, he got uh, disilylation. So he got double silylation, far more silylation than he expected. Um, and he looked, actually, again, by mass spectrometry for this disilylated um, lactose, which is a really unexpected structure, and he found that doing glycoproteomics, you could identify a lot of peptides that have this disilylated structure. And that was completely unexpected. Uh, and we had three candidates for that particular structure. One is starting to the 2,8, which gives you the polysilylation. Uh, one which has this internal uh, silylation, and these two structures are described, but you would not expect that our enzymes would make these structures because they're not silylation on galactose. And then the third one, which we could only find really as a fragment in the literature a Japanese group had described this, is this unusual disilylation. Uh, so basically, this makes actually biosynthetic sense. You can get both silylation at 2, 3, and 2, 6 on the same galactose. To our knowledge, this has never been described before. Um, and actually, what Ed did is develop some mass spec tools for that, looking either for the fragment, but also, again, iron mobility, which allowed him to really distinguish between uh, these different isomers. So actually, I'm bringing this up because I know a lot of you doing sort of uh, uh, glycomics, and there'd be a question whether anyone is 
actually observe this structure. Uh, you don't need an extra enzyme for this. So this is an alpha-2,6 salar transferase, which just puts another salic acid onto an existing 2,3 uh, structure. So it shows you actually when you dig down into these, these, you know, you find new structure. I'm not saying this is a human structure because we have used a bacterial enzyme, you know, for this reaction. But it would be very interesting to see whether, you know, the, this structure crops up uh, in, in, in human structures. So in, co in conclusion, I'm hoping I've shown you uh, that uh, galactose oxidases might be quite used complementary tools for cell surface labeling and labeling of glycans. Uh, glycosyl transferases and glycosylases are clearly important, and the challenge there is to sort of get more activities and get robust enzymes that can be used by wider community. And I hopefully also shown you a little bit that this hyphenated ion mobility mass spectrometry helps us to really identify the structures with, with, with high um, precision. So it reminds me to thank people, my collaborators and my group, particular Ashley, Chris Gray and Ed Pallister, who did a lot of the work I've just shown, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.